This is day 20, and we are in Acts chapter 20. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. God, thanks so much for today, and thank you for the weekend and an opportunity to be with family and friends and neighbors to get recharged. And God, we now turn to your word and look to you to inform us of who we are and the purpose that you have for us on this earth. We ask that your word would speak to us today, that it would guide us, that it would comfort us, that it would point us in the right direction. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, let's dive in. First one, when the uproar had ended, uh, talking about the riot that was happening before, as we talked about yesterday. So when the uproar, uh, uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. Uh, he traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally ar arrived in Greece, uh, where he stayed there three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by, uh, yep, Sopator, son of Phyrus. We got uh, some awesome names coming up here. All right, I'm going to butcher these. Um, from Berea, um, Ar Aristarchus. <laughs> and Segundus from Thessalonica, Gaius and Derby from Derby, Timothy, that's an easy one. Also, and um, Tydicus, maybe, something like that. And eh, Tromphemus from the province of Asia. All right, these men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And five days later, we joined the others in Troas, where we stayed for seven days. All right, uh, we're going to hear about Eutychus. This is pretty cool. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Now, I read about this, and they were talking about because the amount of candles that were probably lit in the upper room, a number of them that were in the upper room had been working all day. There were a number of slaves that were working all day. So they were even saying how the, the candles kind of suck out the oxygen. Maybe that's why Eutychus fell asleep. Um, we're guessing it's not because of uh, Paul's lack of passion <laughs> or, uh, as he taught. So this guy Eutychus, he, he's, he's about to pass out here. Uh, and he was singing into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man. This reminded of us of some Old Testament stuff. It's awesome. Jesus, uh, Lazarus, on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then we went back upstairs again and broke bread and ate. And we did this until daylight, and then he left. The people took the young men home alive, and we were greatly comforted. Now, that's a church service, all right? I mean, can you imagine, uh, one, um, they weren't in a hurry to leave. They they were with each other until the sunrise. They were hungry for God's word. They were hungry to hear from the apostles' teaching. As we talked about last Sunday, they were devoted to this. I mean, it wasn't something that they dabbled in. They certainly weren't disengaged. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching to the extent that they were there until sunrise. Now, uh, that being said, when someone is raised from the dead, that definitely keeps your interest <laughs> pretty high. All right, verse 13. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed uh, from Asos, and they're going uh, to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Asos, we took him aboard and went um, to that city. Not, not sure how to say that one. The next day we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. Uh, the day after we crossed over to uh, Samos and the following day arrived at Miletus, maybe? Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, know that one, to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, to be there by the day of Pentecost. So Paul was, if, you know, he had it set in his mind to try to get to Jerusalem by the Passover, um, but that wasn't working out, uh, so he's, he was set to try to get there by Pentecost. Uh, from uh, Miletus, Paul sent for Ephesus to the elders of the church where they arrived, and he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Although I was severely tested by the plot of the Jews, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything 
that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, we're about to hear the mission statement of the Apostle Paul. Get ready. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among uh, who, who have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Second time we hear that word tears. Now I commit to you, uh, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver, gold, or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus uh, himself. And he says it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept and they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of God. And some really neat things that are going on here in, in chapter 21 is we're seeing that Luke, the author of Acts, is now back with Paul. And we're getting an eyewitness account again. Uh, the last time that was happening was back in chapter 16. If you remember, um, the kind of tone there was we. <clears throat> and here, in, I think it's verse 5, uh, we're, um, it's, it's clear that Luke is with him again. Da, 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 da. Yeah, there's verse five. Um, these men went on ahead of, uh, on ahead and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed. So uh, Luke is clearly back with with Paul again. Um, and another thing that really really stood out, um, three different times, you know, uh, depending on what translation, the word tears is mentioned. This is really important for us to understand. I think the tone of of really what's going on in chapter 20. Uh, we, we get a picture of um, the tension that there is within the kingdom, uh, within the mission of God. Let me explain what I mean by that. On one hand, we see exciting things happen, wonderful things happen. Eutychus, for example, raised from the dead, the church meeting till sunrise, breaking bread together. Uh, these are exciting, exciting things, and that certainly is on, on one side of the coin. On the other side, we see uh, sadness and sorrow. Uh, tears are happening. And, and this is what it is in, the, is in the kingdom of God, and this is what God is teaching me about his mission. Um, the mission demands that we continue to advance and move forward. You know, one of our values as a church is reproducing, and we long to reproduce on every level of our church, leaders, groups, and eventually um, to have multiple campuses at our church, eventually to be able to plant a number of churches. The only way that will ever happen is for the mission of God to be central in our hearts and minds. And this is what we see in the New Testament. We see Paul, who, you know, they wanted him to stay at Ephesus. These elders were distraught that he was leaving. But the mission that God poured into his heart and, and the vision of the kingdom demanded that Paul leave. And as, as we see there, as the chapter ends, that they would never see his face again. So, so I think that's really important for you and for me to see once again that the mission of God, it, it kind of is a paradox. On one side, it is so exciting. On the other side, it is, it is sorrowful. But we have to advance because people must hear. And, and that kind of leads into the next thing that is really, the, to me, the central thing of this chapter. We see the mission of the Apostle Paul. We see that he is very clear on why he exists. I've got two questions for you uh, this morning. One is this, 
Are you clear on your mission? Are you clear on your mission? Paul was very clear on this, and, and I looked this up. Um, you, could, um, you could say his mission statement was this. It was testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's, that's really his mission statement. He woke up and went to bed every day understanding, and, and he was very clear on why he existed. Uh, we see that. Here's some places. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 5, 6, and 12. Philippians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Colossians 1. And kind of the, a really famous one is there in 2 Timothy 4, and obviously here in verse 24. Um, just to remind you what he says in verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I want to challenge you this morning to really consider coming up with a, a life statement, something that gives you clarity and purpose and focus. Um, I, I would guess a number of you have yet to really get clear from God's word all right, on why you exist. What is your why? Uh, what is driving you day in and day out? Paul had one, and, and he was very clear on this. And here's the second thing. The second question I have is, do you have a higher yes? Uh, this past week, I, I read through a book called Replenish. Really good book. Uh, recently came out, and it was all about taking care of your soul. Um, but there was a, a quote in there, and, and part of what he was saying is, in essence, you will burn out and your soul will deteriorate if you don't understand how to say no. And from there, he pulled a quote uh, from this other author named uh, William uh, Urey. And here's the quote, and it is awesome. So this is all around the second question. Do you have a higher yes? Here's the quote. Like all good no's, ours were in service to a higher yes. I love it. Let me read it again. Like all good no's, ours were in service to a higher yes. Why is that important? Paul was able to say no to a lot of things because he was clear on a higher yes. Paul was able to say no to things because he met, he knew in his heart that he must say yes to something that was much higher, and that was testifying to the gospel of God's grace. You and I go throughout our day saying yes to so many things that have nothing to do with what God is leading us and calling us to do. We go throughout our days and throughout our weeks being divided and uh, having no focus because we haven't taken that time to really dig into God's word, to really wait on him, to lean into his spirit, to understand what our higher yes is. And the Apostle Paul absolutely had that. So two questions. Are you clear on your mission? And do you have a higher yes? My hope and my prayer is that God will speak to you. That you'll take some time now, even on Saturday, to get clear on why you exist and what God is calling you to move toward. Acts 20. Tomorrow we're going to dive into Acts 21. Have a great Saturday. God bless.